Hey gamers, this is Liz Davis from Beyond Solitaire, and today I'm absolutely delighted to be interviewing Max Benzavim. He is a game designer, Zenobia finalist, and he's going to be talking to us about his entry, An Outstretched Hand. So how are you doing today, Max? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. No, I'm super happy to have you on. Uh, so uh, for people who have not been following Zenobia, uh, just give us a summary. What is An Outstretched Hand about? Uh, an Outstretched Hand is about the sort of struggle... Uh, for and over the Jews of Eastern Europe in uh, the 19th century. Um, so the players play as one of four different factions at that time that was sort of struggling to sort of exert dominance, control, influence, shape the destiny of the broad masses of Eastern European Jews, um, two of which are sort of national political and two of which are sort of ideological religious. So uh, what are the groups, just for further context? Oh, yeah, sure. So one is the um, sort of the czarist regime, um, which is sort of the prevailing power there. One is the um, sort of the Poles and the Polish faction. A little bit of their character changes changes over time. Um, one is the Haskala movement, which was um, kind of considered the Jewish Enlightenment movement, um, sort of the more liberal um, reforming movement um, of that era. And the other is the Hasidic movement, um, which is a religious revivalist movement um, that emerged um, in the 18th century, but became like much more broadly popular in Jews, especially Jews in that part of the world um, over the course of the 19th century. Interesting. I know very little about this topic, I admit. So uh, what kinds of tensions are in play between these groups? And then how did you mechanically express that in your game? Yeah, sure. So I think maybe just like to take a quick step back and explain sort of like a little bit of where this is all coming from. Um, you know, by the 18th century, by the 1700s, you know, exact numbers hard to come by uh, as there are so many things, but probably at least half and maybe even a large majority of all the Jews in the world were living in the um, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Um, which is which was a, a really large state, much larger than modern day Poland, includes modern day Poland, Lithuania, um, but also like most of what is today Belarus and Ukraine, as well as some of the other neighboring countries. Um, but that state did last. It was partitioned over the course of the late 1700s. Um, and by the time everything got wrapped up with Napoleon, um, all that Michigas, uh, to use a culturally appropriate word, um, most of what was Polish, Polish Lithuania ended up in the hands of the Russian Empire, um, which previously had been a state um, completely closed to Jews and now had probably the largest Jewish population in the world. Um, so a lot of this are about um, sort of the different factions and navigating sort of that kind of revolutionized environment. Um, so the Tsar's faction deciding what to do with all of this, these Jews suddenly within its newly expanded borders. Um, the Poles, who were sort of struggling to uh, figure themselves out economically, assert themselves nationally um, in this new environment where they were suddenly um, not really an independent country anymore, um, as well as these new movements kind of writing broader sort of religious, cultural, intellectual currents in Europe within a specifically Jewish context. And sort of the way that the game mechanically expresses that um, is fairly straightforward, but tries to get at one thing that I thought was sort of key to that dynamic, which is that a lot of these factions um, made as much an effort to gain influence over each other as they did to gain influence directly over the Jews. So as an example, um, the uh, Tsarist Empire often found it um, interesting and convenient to try and promote um, the Haskalah, the Enlightenment uh, movement, in order to try and uh, potentially see that as an avenue to um, bring the Jews into a state that was more favorable to assimilation into Russian society. And in, by contrast, the Haskalah saw the, you know, the power and the resources that, uh, that the like, ruling Russian regime had as its avenue to spread its ideas, right? So they were both trying to like, use each other as their channel. 
um, towards their ultimate goal of sort of bringing the Jews of Eastern Europe sort of into the into the place that they wanted them to be. So mechanically, the game is a little bit dudes on a map. Um, there are nine rounds over which um, the players place cubes um, in nine different map spaces, um, sort of representing the geographical area um, of the game. Um, but un unlike some of these games where the goal is to directly sort of control the most spaces, um, the players, the factions accumulate points over the course of the game for controlling the spaces, but the winner is not the player who has the most points necessarily, but the players are also accumulating cubes of their own faction as well as the other factions in a secret area called their courts. Uh, and the winner of the game is the player who has the most cubes in their court of the player with the most points, right? Um, so it's a little bit of a bet on the winner mechanic as much as it is trying to actually directly get the most points on the board. Interesting. And is this your very first game design or had you kind of poked around at the idea of being a game designer before? Um, and, and this is a, just a project that struck you. Uh, well, I have a, I have a Google drive folder, um, full of like drafts, sketches, half done ideas. There's been a few times before where I've managed to put like a playable prototype, like down on paper. Um, but this is far and away the furthest I've ever taken like an actual like game design idea with like a full manual and a, you know, revised playable prototype, like actually kind of like exposing it to other people um, for their feedback in a more systematic way. So this is this is definitely the by far and away the, the longest um, I've gone down that sort of game design journey, for which I'm really grateful to um, the Zenobia, Zenobia for in terms of creating um, both a lot of that scaffolding to help make that happen, as well as just a lot of the moral support. That's awesome. So uh, before you got started on the process, what what made you decide uh, to go in for Zenobia and how have you, I guess, handled the pressure of trying to design a game in such a short period of time? <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, I'd heard of the, I, you know, I kind of heard and followed a little bit the first Zenobia competition, thought it was cool and awesome. Um, and I think just like sort of like one of those stars align kind of thing that when they were doing the call for this one, um, I had just gotten really into this topic um, and had been even just giving some thought because the way my brain works you know i have this nice big collection of games here is when i get into a topic like one of the ways i think about it is how would i model this topic as a board game you know like how would i explore the topic through that and so i'd already been like giving that some thought and then when they put out the call um i was like well you know like you know 90 percent of life is just showing up right um so uh i figured why not um and bit off substantially more than i could chew uh, probably, <laughs> but, um, it's been, it's, I mean, it's been, I think honestly, it's been like a great experience because even though it has been a lot of pressure in terms of like doing a lot of work and like, you know, thinking through a lot of like really thoughtful, um, and constructive criticism, but also, you know, definitely criticism, um, during the course of the process, right? Like stuff that you actually have to take back and like rethink some of your ideas and be like, am I doing this right? Is this the best way to do this? Am I succeeding in the thing I'm actually trying to do? Right. Um, like doing all that um with the environment has just been so supportive like you know with the judges the mentors but also the the contestants themselves people being really willing to share their own ideas like look at each other's materials play each other's games proofread each other's manuals like all that kind of stuff it's just been it's made it feel fun like 95 to 5 in terms of like a lot of work or a lot of pressure or stress that's really nice. And it sounds like, um, you know, you've been receiving feedback. I know that your final draft of this game is due uh, in a few days. So thanks for taking the time to talk to me. But um, how would you say that your game has evolved and changed uh, since beginning it to now? Oh, uh, a lot. Um, I, In fact, my initial proposal was for an entirely different kind of game. Um, and sort of like as much my sort of entry into this topic was thinking about more sort of the setting at a ground level as opposed to sort of like the high level of the prototype I, I just described, right? Like something like thinking about everyday life and, and what were called the shtetls, right? Like these little market towns all across Eastern Europe, which were where most Jews lived, especially up until like the early to mid 19th century. And I really wanted to try and create a game that sort of explored that environment and a lot more of like sort of that, that human level. Um, 
and that was sort of my original proposal was to design a game that sort of did that. Um, and then I, I could not make it work both like mechanically and also for a lot of, I think what you'd call like representational reasons. Like there are a lot of ways to make that work as a, as a game that was not like in some way, like really problematic or sort of troubling in terms of how it actually like depicted that theme, especially in, um, in a board game type setting, right? Where you're putting a player in certain position and they have to like make certain decisions and pursue certain goals. Um, so from there, I kind of pivoted. I had a couple other sketches of things that sort of, and eventually I sort of worked my way up the scale of like sort of like the level of abstraction and also like the level of scope and zoom out um, until I got to something closer than here. And there were a couple other ideas earlier on. I wanted to take more inspiration from a game called Kvitlak, which was a, sort of a 21 blackjack style card game that was popular among Eastern European Jews in the 19th century. And I wanted to work that more mechanically into the game. Um, and that's still there in the current prototype, but it's like much more for, I think, just sort of like theme and flavor and not there as like, like one of the original designs really was like kind of centered around like the players playing something more more like this game. And that sort of, I couldn't find a way to make that like workable or fun either. So kind of worked its way eventually towards the sort of the current mechanics. Oh, that's interesting. It actually, it sounds like you've kind of told me to answer this question, but in case there's more, I'm going to dig, uh, which is, I was wondering, um, you know, what, what did you discover uh, over the course of your research and design that you thought was really interesting, but didn't quite make it into the game? Oh, I mean, a lot, right? Like the current, because like the current scope of the game, you know, it's a little, I'm being a little ambiguous about the time frame, but it takes place like over, I think like something probably nailing down would be like a 60 year period over like most of the middle of the 19th century, right? Um, and over like a huge geographic area. And it's like, really smooth down like a goal i really wanted to have with this game was to make it approachable to people whose reason for getting to the game was maybe interest in the topic and the theme and not so much having like you know whatever 100 board games on their shelves right um so i really tried to make you know like there's only like one type of piece that you could put on the board right um the game is has a little bit of inspiration from the coin series but it's not like you know where you know there's different types of pieces that have different rules there's no ace there's no like kind of like rule book based asymmetry between the factions. Um, so I think like there's a ton of things that I learned that were things that in some ways were some of the things that attracted me or motivated me to, to think more about the topic, but that like couldn't really get expressed in this format. I think the things that I'm able to capture, you know, and especially, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that like as I continue to develop the game, I'll be able to work in more like, you know, things like flavor text and the cards, stuff like that. Um, but a lot of like, um, you know, I read one really interesting book um, and the name of the author is escaping me. It was entitled The Golden Age Dettel. I can, I can look that up um, before, we, before we get off the horn. Um, but there's like a long, um, one of the long segments is just dis discussing sort of like how um, basically a lot of the, uh, the Jewish traders um, were navigating um, the sort of new world of like sort of Russian borders um, and Russian trade restrictions. Um, basically, in, in a nutshell, the czarist regime tried to crack down on uh, trade, like, you know, between its neighbors, um, a lot of which was disproportionately done um, by Jewish merchants. Um, and the Jewish merchants um, basically just spent decades finding like increasingly creative, ingenious ways to get around those restrictions. Um, either by evading customs or subordinating customs officials and you know all all these different ways of basically ensuring that they're they're on their their you know centuries of trade into these other areas you know from like Austria Germany onwards um, could continue and there was just so much colorful stuff about like the specific goods they were bringing over like the ways that they would you know hide things from the customs officials or get the customs officials on their side like create entire cottage industries of like making customs systems work for them um you know and that ended up being something one that you can't really represent in a game that has like nine rounds dudes on a map over you know that huge area right but also i think kind of points to a little bit of what I found challenging about some of those human level designs, right? Because I think that, you know, when you, there are certain things that I think if you portray in a certain context can be, you know, kind of like kind of 
neatly unproblematic and then in other contexts can you know raise more questions about the sensitivity with which you portray them right like i own um sheriff of nottingham um a delightful game where you know the players try to smuggle things past each other they're you know they're trying to you know be de deceive each other you know um be a little cunning being a little conniving and sort of like that sort of like yield english setting has you know kind of like you know like no thematic interaction that sort of makes that problematic but then when you put it in a jewish context right you're like oh these jewish people they are breaking laws and maybe you know telling lies in order to move goods across borders in pursuit of money it's like are are you telling that story in a way that doesn't you know inadvertently you know further like negative stereotypes like that's like that's like a harder thing to do um and one that was a honestly a bit of a daunting challenge for you know someone who's like new to game design like me and you know i was at some point I had to decide how much I wanted to tell a certain story versus how much I wanted to tell a story that I could be comfortable with putting out in the world in the in the form that I was putting it out right yeah that, that actually makes a whole lot of sense so on that note what are you hoping that people who play your game will come away with in terms of an understanding about the topic that you're presenting this way <sighs> that's a really good question um you know something that I think you know, as I have looked into this topic um, and, and done more research into it, you know, it's something where I'd, it, it is my background. I'm of Eastern European Jewish descent. Um, and I think it's something that a lot of people, you know, feel, especially people for whom that is their background, feel that they have some familiarity with, right? Like people, you know, hear stories from their parents and their grandparents. Um, they may have seen like a handful of prominent cultural representations of this era, you know, like Fiddler on the Roof comes to mind. Um, but actually, you know, reading it, I felt like it was in a, a period of history that is sort of ill understood or even misunderstood, including and perhaps especially by the people whose history it is. And it's not necessarily history that folk, that there's like kind of like a strong inclination to sort of look back into and try and like represent for a mass audience a little bit more like trying to like actually look back and, and tell the story, you know, you know, more with an eye towards like, you know, what we can say today based on the historical record. And I think for me, like wanting to like see like what was it really like then, you know, what 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 was the world of my my ancestors, but also like what was, you know, I think in a broader world sense, you know, a an important part of global history um trying to you know take a lot of the work that you know i think you know obviously uh, like a lot of academics and researchers and, and other thinkers have done to try and like sort of rebuild a more robust historical record around that time and try and condense it into a more historical form that at least kind of brings people to be like oh maybe this the story here isn't the story that i thought it was or i never quite had the story in my mind that way and there's more to see and think about here um, and to kind of like ignite some more interest in that, like that would be if, if this game design could lead to any number of people having that thought and that experience, I'd be really, really happy. All right. That is a perfect place to end the serious questions. So now you get a couple of softy ones. Uh, so, um, what games have you been playing recently that bring you some joy? Oh, um, recently that bring me some joy. Um, well, I, play a lot of Carcassonne and Azul always. Those are always two of the favorites. Um, one game that I played recently that I found really interesting um, was, oh, and now I can't remember the name of it, but it was about the U.S. presidential election of, and oh, now I'm, my history is just giving me either 1824 or 1828. No, no, it's oh. 1824 or 1828. Um, the election with, um, the election with, um, uh, Jackson and Adams and Calhoun and uh, not Calhoun, Henry Clay um, and, and Calhoun actually the, and with the corrupt bargain. And I, I cannot remember the name of this game. I'm so sorry. I can, I can look it up. And no, no, I'm looking now too. We're going to uh, look this up and then I'm going to edit it together because I um, need to know. Yeah. <laughs> but it was funny because um, some, some, some friends of ours um, recently got it as a gift and invited us to play it. Um, and this was just like a few weeks ago and it was like one of those weird things where like i'm in the middle of designing this game and we're playing this game and i'm like oh this game is like weirdly similar to the game that i'm even though i'd never heard of it or played it before like not like that that similar but like similar enough in some ways that i was like 
like really like, oh, that's so funny and that's so interesting. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a clever design um, because it's trying to simulate this, this real four-way presidential election that happened and like the rules of the U.S. presidential, election, uh, presidential elections are that um, if no, no candidate gets a majority of electoral votes, it goes to the House. Um, which is, you know, rarely a, like a, like a likely consideration, like, you know, a two-way presidential election, but in a four-way presidential election, it's like much more likely. So in the game, you're basically trying to play for both, like there's basically a two-step victory thing where it's like, first, do you outright win the majority electoral college? If not, it goes to the house. And then do you win right. the election in the house? So you're, you're, you're sort of like trying to play at both elections at once. And you can't get to the second election unless you place in the top three of the first one. So it's like, you're like, you can't lose. You can't come fourth in that first round. Um, but so you need to try right, and position. What are you playing team. for a long term? Is this corrupt bargain? Yes. Yeah, I think that's the what it's called. The 1824 yeah, yeah. presidential election from Decision Games. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I was, I thought that was, I was, it was very nifty. Um, it was very fun. Like it was, and it was like, it was, it was like, I also like, admired it because it like achieved i thought one of the goals i had with my game which is that like it wasn't like it was simple enough that you could teach like that like literally none of us really knew how to play it we managed to like teach ourselves from the manual and sit down and play it in like a relatively short amount of time it didn't take a lot of time to get it to the table and set up we could kind of just go with the flow and, and figure out a little bit as we went along um but still have fun playing it and still feel like we all had like our hat in the ring to actually try and win the game and the ending kind of like surprised us and we all realized like oh like you know, like if you don't think hard enough about this part early on in the game, then you know it's like it, it, had, it had like a lot of like nice moments like that. Um, so that was that was a fun one. All right, I gotta play this now. Uh, and then if you um, are online and want to be found by people, where can that be? Uh, yeah, you can find me on Discord, and my username is it's to be checking Max Bento, um, M A X B E N T O. Uh, and my board game geek is just my name, Max Bentovim. Perfect. Uh, Max, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about your game. I'm super excited to see where it's going to go, and I wish you all the best of luck. Congrats so much on being a Zenobia finalist. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here, and thanks again to Zenobia and everyone involved in it for making such an awesome experience. All right, everybody out there, if you're looking for me, I can be found anywhere online as Beyond Solitaire. Uh, please like, subscribe, comment, ask questions, and most of all, Happy gaming.